Um, it's a pleasure to welcome all of you here today uh, for this event organized by our colleagues. Uh, my name is Daisy Delahou. I'm the director this year of the University of Chicago Center in Paris. So the center, for those of you who are not familiar with it, opened in 2003, which is the year that I started at the University of Chicago, although I did not come here until 2010. Uh, so the center is comprised of um, a cluster of buildings, several classrooms. We welcome every quarter, um, typically three to four different uh, undergraduate academic programs. Right now we have 50 plus uh, students uh, in residence taking classes here. We also have usually about 10 or so doctoral students uh, who've come from the US working in different fields in sociology, in literature, music, art history, etc., who use the center um, as a kind of home base. Uh, they have office space available to them. They're close to the bayonet. They're close to their home. Um, and they can use also the printers and office equipment. We um, also host a large number, this year an especially large number because it's post-COVID. So all of the 18 months worth of colloquia, talks, conferences that were to have been held have sort of piled up this year along with the ones we would normally have hosted. And so sometimes, I would say actually less typically they involve just the University of Chicago faculty and much more often involve collaborations um, with uh, colleagues either in Paris or in de France or really um, across uh, Europe simply because it's much easier to bring people together here than to have a bunch of people come across the ocean uh, to uh, do work with us uh, and have conversation with people in Chicago. Uh, and we also have a series um, of events that uh, we help to finance that are initiated by local uh, faculty, local um, scholars, where we have kind of seed money that we are able to offer um, to help them uh, hold events. And we're happy to be able to share our space uh, in those instances as we're doing today. And so, um, yeah. We're very happy to have you here. We're very happy to be able to be in person, even though it's a little weird and masky and distance, uh, and also dual format, which is kind of cool, actually. Um, so yeah, that's, I guess, everything I have to say. Very glad to have you. Thank you so much, Tracy. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, we're very happy to have you here at the University of Chicago Center in Paris, and also online. And of course, we are very happy to have Cherise Byrne Stelly with us. Uh, Dr. Sharice Bergenstelli is an assistant professor of Afri Africana Studies and Political Science at Carleton College. Mm -hmm. She's a co-author with uh, Dr. Jell Holm uh, of W.E.B. Du Bois, A Life in American History. And she's currently working on a soon-to-be-published book entitled Black Scare, Red Scare, Anti-Blackness, Anti-Communism and the Rise of Capitalism in the United States. Uh, Charis, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. When I first uh, met you, Charis, at the Schomburg Center in New York City, mm -hmm. if, I think it was two years ago, something like that, uh, I thought that it, it would be so great if you could come to Paris, you know, and uh, talk about your work. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, at the time, I had just co-founded a seminar on socialism in the United States. Uh, which is called uh, Du Socialisme en Amérique in French. And uh, so uh, I talked uh, about your work on W.E.B. Du Bois uh, to my colleagues, and we decided to invite you. Uh, um, unfortunately, we had to postpone uh, because of COVID, but uh, we finally made it. You're here. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> So before you start your presentation, I would like to thank the, the co-organizers of this event, my colleagues, uh, Alice Béja, Hélène Conquin, and uh, Clément Petitjean. Uh, thanks also to Paris Nanterre University, uh, Lille University, and Sciences Po Lille, and also the laboratories, uh, Cécile, Seraps, and CREA for their support. And finally, uh, a special thank to the University of Chicago Center in Paris, of course, to Marie Sakian, the communication manager, to Sébastien Grepo, the, administ the administrative director, 
and also to uh, Daisy Delavigne, the, the academic director. Thank you for everything. Uh, now, let's listen to uh, your presentation, Cheris, um, a presentation which is uh, entitled uh, Between Radicalism and Repression, W.E.V. Du Bois, Socialism and Black Liberation. And, and then we have a, a Q&A. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Fix my hair. Sorry. I'm on camera. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And let me just start by apologizing that it is in English. I am an ignorant American. <laughs> I only speak English. I do speak some Spanish, but um, my presentation will be in English tonight. And then I just wanted to, you know, I'm sure it. Uh, much to your chagrin, W.E.B. Du Bois's name is pronounced Du Bois, not Du Bois, despite all of the pushback I get about this, despite writing a book on him. And so I just wanted to share, he actually wrote um, a letter on January 20th, 1939 um, to the Chicago, the Chicago Sunday Evening Club where he actually expressed how to pronounce his name. He said, my name is pronounced in the English fashion, Du with you as in Sue. Boys as oi in voice. The accent is on the second syllable. So it is the boys. <laughs> just wanted to emphasize that. Um, so let me just go ahead uh, and get started. We have a lot of ground to cover. So in 1961, at the age of 93, William Edward Burkhard Du Bois joined the Communist Party in the United the Communist Party of the United States of America shortly before relocating to Accra, Ghana. It was a culminating event in a process of radicalization that spanned several decades. James E. Jackson, who was integral to Du Bois joining the party, offered that he had, been, he had become a card-carrying member only after serious study, contemplation, and experimentation. Thus, it was the consummated act of commitment to the social forces which the people can command to forge and fashion for all mankind a bright and joyous future. That's a quote from James Jackson. Doxy Wilkerson agreed that Du Bois knew, quote, this system had to go, had to be changed, and so there was no other course than to fully commit to communism, end quote. In Herbert Aptheker's opinion, Du Bois understood that the CPUSA embodied the best in the radical and liberating tradition of this country and the best in the egalitarian and militant traditions in humanity. As such, joining the party symbolized his convictions as to what was true and what was necessary. A particular period of radicalization in Du Bois' life that created the conditions for that momentous occasion might be called the Black Reconstruction Era, spanning roughly 1931 to 1937, in which he brought together Black liberation and socialism in teaching Marxist courses at Atlanta University, organizing the Second Amenia Conference, debating the merits of a separate Black cooperative economy, and of course, writing and publishing the magisterial Black Reconstruction in America, an essay toward a history of the part which Black folk played in the attempt to reconstruct democracy in America, 1860 to 1880. <laughs> that is the full title. From there, Du Bois' uh, peace activism after World War II articulated linked forms of radicalism, including socialism, pan-Africanism, Black internationalism, anti-imperialism, and anti-colonialism. Uh, his suturing of Black liberation and socialism elicited statist and social backlash, including his arrest, indictment, and abandonment by the class of Blacks he had championed for much of his life, uh, the Talented Tenth. So in terms of the outline for uh, my talk this evening, I'll start by, by uh, outlining what I call the tradition of radical Blackness in which Du Bois' praxis is in place. Then I will give an overview of the Black Reconstruction era, uh, era in which he combined Black liberation and socialism. I'll talk a bit about his radical Black peace activism after World War II. And in part four, I want to think with this document called that he wrote in 1959 called Lenin in Africa um, to think about some of the broad themes of Du Bois' linkages of Black liberation and socialism, including internationalism, anti-imperialism, and repression. And I'll uh, conclude with um, a description of the punishment to which he was subject, uh, subjected because of his, his radicalism. So in the context of the United States, there have been two prominent dialectics at play 
um, in terms of what I'm focusing on. One is a dialectic between black liberation and socialism. So if it is we think with the conceptual framework of racial capitalism, there's a lot of controversy around the use of that term, but essentially what it describes is that the US is rooted in racial hierarchy and capitalist exploitation. And so the sort of two ways to overcome those structures of domination is through a project of black liberation and a socialism. The second dialectic is between radicalism and repression generally, but black radicalism and anti-communist repression as a particular specification of that, uh, that dialectic. And so my book project focuses on the way that um, anti-blackness and anti-communism are mutually constitutive in the United States um, as each build upon the other because of the ways that racial hierarchy are endemic in its modes of accumulation and the ways that its modes of accumulation reinscribe racial hierarchy. <laughs> So the tradition of radical blackness uh, is, let me just define this a little bit. Um, according to the revolutionary psychiatrist and freedom fighter, Frantz Fanon, Marxism required modification when applied to the colonial situation. In the colonies, the economic substructure, sub, substructure is also a superstructure, he argued. Quote, the cause is the consequence. You are rich because you are white. You are white because you are rich. This is why Marxist analysis should always be slightly stretched every time we have to do with the colonial problem, end quote. He further argued that racial subjection could not be fully understood apart from capitalist exploitation. Quote, the Negro problem does not resolve itself into a, a problem of, of Negroes living among white men, but rather of Negroes exploited, enslaved, despised by a colonialist capitalist society that is only accidentally white, end quote. Like that of Fanon, Du Bois's corpus of work demonstrates that only through a rigorous analysis, trenchant critique, and vehement rejection of both racial and class antagonism um, can global conditions of dehumanization be upended. Both thus belong to what I call the tradition of radical blackness, which stretched anti-capitalism by censoring the exploitation, domination, and oppression of African descendant peoples. The tradition of radical blackness can be understood as black anti-capitalist thoughts and activism rooted in and attendant to local, national, and global anti-black political economies. This tradition theorizes blackness as a special relationship to the capitalist mode of production, considers intra-racial class conflict and antagonism, and strives for the eventual overthrow of racial capitalism. Informed by and engaged with real world struggles, it encompasses African descendants multivalent and persistent anti-systemic and counter-hegemonic challenges to material and discursive processes and practices that sustain exploitation, exclusion, dispossession, and dominated, uh, domination rooted in racial and gender hierarchies. As such, it is systematically targeted, often through discourses of anti-communism, by statist and imperial authorities as extremism, authoritarianism, and or terrorism to rationalize the use of extraordinary force, violence, and exception. Such an expansive tradition necessarily constitutes real and significant ideological, analytical, and conceptual differences, disagreements, and antipathies. However, these contradictions and antagonisms demonstrate the heterogeneous and, com and complicated ways that freedom fighters from Esther V. Cooper uh, to C.L.R. James, Claudia Jones to Kwame Nkrumah struggled against racial capitalism. It's important to note that the connection between, or it's important to note the connection between the tradition of radical blackness and Cedric Robinson's black radical tradition, the latter of which emphasizes culturally encoded challenges to the racial and nationalist foundations of international capitalism. As Robin D.G. Kelly writes, Robinson sought to quote, rewrite the history of the West from ancient times to the mid 20th century, scrutinizing the idea that Marxist categories of class can be universally applied outside of Europe, end quote. Robinson believed that instead of a radical rupture from feudalism in the Marxist sense, capitalism was a continuation of European feudalism's racialism that developed into an international system of exaggerated difference predicated upon slavery, imperialism, genocide, and violence. He posited that intra-European ethno-nationalism transformed into even more pernicious forms of segregation of non-Europeans as capitalism spread throughout the world. As such, the black radical tradition names the rebellions and expressions of African descendants meant to challenge the system that, according to Robinson, Marxism misrecognizes through its universalization of European realities. <laughs> 
On his view, racialization is the transhistorical and structuring feature of international economic and social relations. As such, the most robust and significant black radical challenges to exploitation and exclusion emanate from endogenous black and African metaphysics and cultural forms. By contrast, the tradition of radical blackness conceptualizes racialization, especially its enunciation of anti-blackness as imbricated with the capitalist mode of production, understood as a unique world historical formation in which both blackness and radicalism inexorably threaten property relations, divisions of labor, and hierarchical economic relations that constitute the modern world system. Thus, attention to critical political economy, the capitalist foundations of racialization, and the discursive strategies that maintain and reproduce racial subjugation are paramount. So this is essentially the distinction between my conceptualization and that of, of Cedric Robinson. I'm not saying it's better, it's just different. Um, so in terms of the Black Reconstruction era, during the Great Depression, W.E.B. Du Bois underwent a gradual but enduring transformation into a radical Black intellectual and activist. His militancy on, on, the, on issues including the role of Black workers in the production of history, separate economic development, racial solidarity, and Black self-determination were influenced not only by the ravaging of U.S. Blacks by the catastrophic failure of capitalism in 1929, but also by his study of Marxism and his regular exchanges with a cadre of left-wing scholars and activists, including Ralph Bunch, 1930s Ralph Bunch, not later Ralph Bunch, um, James W. Ford, and Islanda Robeson. Perhaps his greatest accomplishment of that decade was the drafting and publication of his magnum opus, Black Reconstruction, which effectively consolidated his position on the left. By December 1933, he had completed the first draft of Black Reconstruction. Um, that year, he was also engaged in an intensive study of Marxism, um, as, everyone must, as everyone must these days, as he put it, and had conceptualized two leftist courses to be taught at Atlanta University, one was Karl Marx and the Negro Problem, and the other was the Economic History of the Negro. The Marx course, which was to include a study of Capital and the Communist Manifesto, and assignments that applied Marxism to the Negro Problem in the US, was the first of its kind at Atlanta University, and one of the first to be taught in the US Academy. He insisted that the radical, the radical economist Abram Harris, who himself had just completed a new interpretation of Marx, rush him a list of works which the perfect Marxian must know. Most of Harris's recommendations, including history of economic doctrines and the essentials of Marx, ended up uh, as required reading for the Marx course or in the classroom library on socialism and communism, which uh, Du Bois argued was probably at the, uh, at the time the best in the South. For the course, The Economic History of the Negro, he used The Black Worker, co-authored by Harrison Sterling D. Spiro, as a primary text. Uh, later, Du Bois suspected that these courses, especially the Marx course, eventually stirred up opposition against him. For example, Spellman President Florence Reed attempted to keep, uh, to keep out his radical influence by delaying his full appointment to Atlanta University's faculty and stymieing his attempts to start the, the journal Phylon. This mild version of anti-radicalism was a, a precursor to the much more virulent and extreme forms of red baiting that will occur later in his life. To complete Black Reconstruction, Du Bois enlisted the help of several Black leftists, including the Howard radicals Emmett Dorsey, E. Franklin Frazier, and of course, Abram Harris, all of who participated in the second Amenia Conference on a new program for the Negro, held from August 18th through August 21st, 1933. Under the auspices of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Du Bois aimed to bring together 25 thought leaders um, who he described as old enough to have been out of school for a few years, but young enough to not be fixed in their ideas, to have a frank discussion about the status of the American Negro and to innovate a plan suited to the improvement of the Black condition in the 1930s. He acknowledged that differences in ideology, perspective, and policy were real. Thus, leaders must be acquainted with and understand each other in order to engage in clear discussion, careful study, and earnest investigation, and to discourage uh, open contradiction, opposition, and misunderstanding. Du Bois' uh, du Bois's proposes, proposed discussion topics reflected where he was in his own ideological development. Um, these topics included the weakness and, and accomplishments of the old programs uh, to the approach to the Negro question, the possibilities and pitfalls of organized business, liberal reform, socialism and communism, voluntary and involuntary segregation and nationalism, the relation of American Negroes to those in Africa, um, in Africa, the Caribbean and South America, and the possibilities of revolt and revolution. 
33 students, writers, and teachers whose average age was 32 attended the conference and critically examined and evaluated uh, the Negro's existing situation in the changing world scene and considered underlying principles for future action. They suggested that Negro progress was predicated upon an interracial partnership of, la of labor unionists taking the lead in political and economic life. They also urged Blacks to unite across seeming class differences to ameliorate, ameliorate conditions of economic dispossession that pervaded Black existence. The centering of workers, the emphasis on resolving economic conditions, and the critique of extant welfare organizations was a sign of the times as the ravages of the Great Depression had resulted in a worldwide political shift to the left. The criticism of the extant labor movement's anti-Black and elitist methods of organizing, particularly its policy of securing employment and wages and wage increases for highly skilled white workers, was consonant with Du Bois's criticism of the failure of integrationist efforts and its promotion of all Black cooperatives to secure economic betterment. The historical ambivalence and indifference of white workers towards their black counterparts from the socialist movement of the 1890s to the American Federation of Labor was endemic in the U.S. labor movement. Thus, Du Bois saw no salvation at that time um, in, in interracial organizing, uh, not least because it was just as uh, petty bourgeois and capitalistic as the capitalists themselves. Rather, he put all of his hope and faith in, uh, quote, cooper cooperation, chiefly consumers, partly producers, carried on within the Negro race through segregated activities, partly forced and partly voluntary, and calculated to train the Negroes as socialistic citizens of whatever new state comes out of this depression, end quote. So here, he's promoting a type of socialism that is race-based because of the realities of, of white supremacy and anti-Black racism in the United States. And so he's not calling for the type of Jim Crow segregation that organized the society as such, but as he said, it's, it was partly out of uh, force and partly out of uh, voluntary cooperation because he thought that that presented the best way of, of sort of uplift for the race. He believed that consumer cooperatives could be success, uh, successful under the careful planning and, and intense scientific economic study of trained leaders, that if Black farmers worked together, they could produce food for large segments of the Black population, that artists and artisans could organize their services for, to produce clothing, shelter, and goods, and that Black people could harness sheep power in the Southeast to form manufacturing cooperatives. Such a program will require socialized medicine and hospitalization. This what he called this economic protect, uh, protective separatism um, and said that it demanded the leadership of young educated men and women who were not selfish and stupid exploiters and black business leaders retrained along socialist lines to strive for industrial democracy um, and not for the profit motive. So he still has a an orientation toward a, a talented 10th or top down model as he's still advocating for a class of trained leaders, but they're trained to uh, be focused on the uplift of the community as a whole. And um, it's a sort of, it's based on a, a profit sharing and a collective model. Um, at the second, uh, the second Amenia Conference's choice of reform democracy over fascism and communism was also an articulation of Du Bois's position in the 1930s. Conference participants argued, quote, the conference is opposed to fascism because it, it would crystal, crystallize the Negro's position at the bottom of the social structure. Communism is impossible without a fundamental transformation in the psychology and attitude of white workers on the race question and a change in the Negro's conception of himself as a worker. The interest of the Negro cannot be adequately safeguarded by white paternalism in government. It is absolutely indispensable that in this attempt of the government to control agriculture and industry, there be adequate Negro representation. In 1933, Du Bois likewise held that each race was entitled to find a national center for its highest hopes, that Black folks had the right to earn a living and to develop themselves to their highest capabilities, and that Blacks should have an equal representation in, in the government and equal share in New Deal appropriations. He had uh, reached this conclusion as early as 1926 after his trip to the Soviet Union. Reflecting on his visit there, he wrote, quote, I saw clearly when I left Russia that our American Negro belief that the right to vote would, get, would give us work and decent wage and that our poverty was not our fault, but our misfortune, the result and aim of our segregation and color caste, that the solution of letting a few of our capitalists share uh, with whites in the exploitation of our masses would never be a solution of our problem. 
He did not, however, believe that communism of the Soviet or the CPUSA variety was adequate to address the unique plight of black people, but he did believe that intelligent leaders could guide the race to consume consciously and to produce for use and not for profit, and that a slow and orderly redistribution of wealth was possible and necessary. Given black folks' state of development, Du Bois disagreed with extreme communism on two points. The first was the role of the masses in leadership. He did not believe that the masses could drive structural change. Instead, it was the responsibility of exceptional leaders to direct the race. His second point of contention was regarding violent revolution. Du Bois found the latter dictum particularly odious because he believed it was suicidal at best for Blacks. Like the enslaved, the enslaved who took up arms during the Civil War and Black Reconstruction, Du Bois implored that the best course of action for his race was not to lead in any armed insurgency, but to wait, uh, to wait watchfully, assess the situation, and carefully prepare for struggle. In 1934, Du Bois' increasing inclination toward autonomous cooperative economic development caused him to part with the NAACP for the first time. Since its inception, the crisis had been financially independent from the NAACP, which allowed it to function as a periodical dedicated to radical reform, despite the conservative and capitalist bent of the NAACP executive board, and that was notwithstanding the inclusion of a couple socialists like Mary Ovington White. However, when the depression hit, it was unable to, it, it being the crisis, was unable to sustain itself. So in 1932, it became a traditional organ of the, of the association to stay afloat financially. This increased scrutiny, along with Du Bois' argument that pervasive anti-Blackness in the United States required Black folks in the U.S. Um, and beyond to organize and build in unison um, to sustain their own institutions inaugurated an untenable dispute between Du Bois and Walter White, who had become executive secretary after James Weldon Johnson resigned in 1931. In a letter to Harry E. Davis, Du Bois explained that after the crisis had been put under the sole management of George Streeter and Roy Wilkins at the behest of the Spingarns, um, he offered his resignation. Though the matter was briefly resolved, there was ill feeling on both sides. Du Bois uh, opined that the board had resented him for two or three years because he felt that Walter White was a poor leader of the association and had said, uh, said as much to him at, and to the board. Additionally, in, writing, in writings including the right to work, does the Negro need separate schools, a Negro nation within a nation, and social planning for the Negro past and present, Du Bois urged Blacks to plan a separate economy in the spirit of survival, self-preservation, and sustainable struggle. Such espousal of socialism as a racial program and self-determination through pragmatic segregation was out of step with the program of Walter White and the executive board of the NAACP. After all, they're an integrationist organization. Du Bois' criticism of White's tepid and uninformed explanation of the NAACP's stance on segregation resulted in the board voting on May 21st, 1934, that no salaried officer of the association could criticize the policy work, uh, the policy work or officers in the crisis. Given this curtailment of intellectual and political freedom, Du Bois felt his only option was to resign, which he officially did on January 26, 1934. This dispute overshadowed Du Bois' ouster from the NAACP in 1948 because of his uh, criticism of White's capitulation to the Truman administration and his own support for Henry A. Wallace's presidential bid. So here we see as Du Bois um, advocates more, more for a, a militant racial program as well as socialism, he comes at, uh, into conflict with the institutions at which he's laboring. So Atlanta University, um, and then the NAACP twice. And so um, this is sort of a manifestation of the ways that he's kind of moving, well, mo moving rapidly to the left, really. <clears throat> of course, the May 1935 publication of the carefully researched and copiously revised Black Reconstruction, on which Du Bois had been laboring diligently since 1931, was the crowning achievement of this era, that is the Black Reconstruction era. In it, he offered up the following radical thesis. Under extraordinary difficulties, a group of black men trained in slavery and ignorance, emancipated without land or capital, misled, cheated, and despised by thousands of their white fellows, became by the help of other whites and by their own efforts, 12 million Americans with a degree of intelligence and efficiency that gives them the right to stand as average working people comparable with those of any modern white nation. And that thus they are former, uh, forerunners of the uplift of the majority of mankind. And their complete emancipation means the complete emancipation of the working classes of the world. Unless moreover, American Negroes, Negroes succeed in the United States, 
the masses of the modern world cannot succeed in their effort to emerge into real manhood. So this is a, that statement is important for a number of reasons, but one, he's arguing that Black people help to em emancipate themselves. Secondly, that the fate of American Negroes is linked to the fate of racialized and oppressed people throughout the world. So he's thinking um, both locally and internationally. Um, and it's also important because he's positioning Black people as agents of history. And this is the 1930s when it was still believed that Black people were outside of reason, rationality, civilization, <laughs> and had no history worth of, worthy of study, right? And so, so that's a very important thesis. Um, so Du Bois's tome aimed not only to craft a comprehensive, critical, and truthful study of the Civil War and Reconstruction, but also to develop a science of history that arraigned extant American historical practice. Such a science will combat white historians' tendency to document only what they wish to remember, to defend the racism of the South, and to erase slavery from the history of the United States. It would also refute popular academic myths, including that the South did not really support slavery and was actually moving toward emancipation at the time of the Civil War, and that slavery was an insignificant period in American history that could be omitted and forgotten. Rather than emphasize the indolence, criminality, shiftlessness, sickness, and dependence of the formerly enslaved, Du Bois' narrative illuminated that against all odds, this group raised crops, cultivated land, accumulated property, voted, made laws, helped to bring democracy to white and black folk alike, and helped to establish a robust public school system. In this way, his analysis of the effects of the war on emancipation on the nation decentered whiteness and vivified the struggles and efforts of freedmen and denuded the, fa the fairy tales parading as history of reconstruction. Some speculate that this leftist exegesis and investigation got Du Bois blacklisted from subsequent race projects namely an American dilemma, the Negro problem um, and modern democracy. So an American dilemma is like, was like the big work of the 1940s produced by the Swedish uh, socialist uh, Gunnar Myrdal. And it had all of this sort of leading uh, black and white social scientists, but not Du Bois. So Doxy Wilkerson, who first met Du Bois when he was working on the Carnegie Corporation funded study explains, quote, Myrdal and I broke ideologically largely as an idealist versus a materialist approach to interpretation of history. Black Reconstruction is not the kind of interpretation Myrdal was writing, end quote. Myrdal attributed Southern racism to the, attitudes of, to the attitudes of people, even though as a socialist, Wilkerson thought he should have known better than that. Um, by contrast, the boys employed a materialist analysis to explicate the unfolding of Reconstruction and to elucidate the economic imperatives of its racist rollback. As such, Black Reconstruction made numerous contributions to radical scholarship. It paradigmatically transformed enslaved laborers into historical subjects whose participation was in instrumental to the success of the Civil War and to the attempt to uh, democratize the nation thereafter. It excoriated the, the betrayal of Reconstruction, arguing that counter-revolutionary forces aimed to stymie the economic and social development of the freedmen, and that in supporting the suppression of Black folk, white workers undercut their own political and economic power. It centered the formerly enslaved in the history of the era spanning 1860 to 1880, thereby direct, uh, directly challenging anti-Black historiography predicated on the idea that Blacks were inferior and insignificant. And though Du Bois' race precluded him from accessing vital documents that would have strengthened his analysis, his original insights nonetheless inaugurated an epistemologically revolutionary narrative that would animate his own politics and activism for years to come. That is to say that ordinary Black toilers were in fact the agents of freedom and progress. So now I'll turn to his uh, piece, his radical Black peace activism, which is really, really important, especially in our day and age now. Uh, so throughout the 1940s and 1950s, Du Bois' presence in radical circles was ubiquitous. He was involved in or affili affiliated with numerous left-wing organizations, including the American Committee for the Protection of the Foreign Born, the American Labor Party, the Civil Rights Congress, the Council on African Affairs, the, Jeffers the Jefferson School of Social Sciences, the National Council of Arts, Sciences, and Professions, the Peace Information Center, the Southern Negro Youth Congress, and the World Peace Congress. Given his prominence, politics, and experiences of persecution, he was incessantly called upon to participate on committees, to lend his name to causes, and to write letters in defense of victims of anti-radical repression. 
Um, du Bois dedicated himself to an array of leftist causes, especially civil rights for Jews, communists, blacks, and the foreign born, socialism um, and an end to labor exploitation, the liberation of Africa from the colonial and imperial yoke, the defense of communists and other radicals who were political victims and prisoners of the US Cold War state, and the eradication of anti-communist hysteria um, wrought by the Smith and McCarran Acts. Radical Black peace activism brought all of these concerns together, given, the con given his conception of peace, uh, which meant the end of imperialism, the achievement of self-determination, the eradication of apartheid and Jim Crow segregation, and decent and humane material and social conditions for all. So this is not like kumbaya, I don't know if you guys know that reference, but this is not like <laughs> hold hands and be merry pacifism. This is a structural, peace has structural and material foundations um, and can only be achieved through uh, those ends through the, the eradication of structures of domination. Uh, the intensification of his radicalism as he uh, escalated his peace activism was fully consonant with his entire life interest in the cause of promoting peace through understanding among the peoples of the world. So back in 1915, Du Bois's critique of the white peace movement's vitriolic racism expounded the inexorable interconnections of racism, war, and imperialism. And in 1923, he made a similar connection between military aggression, corporate profit, and the reality that, quote, it pays to kill in words, end quote. A 1926 crisis article reiterated his position that wars uh, would not fully disappear unless racism, capitalist imperialism, and direct colonial administration came to an end. He again linked war and economic exploitation and the material dispossession of the oppressed peoples of the world in 1931. Importantly, in Social Planning and the Negro Past and Present, published in 1936, Du Bois criticized both radical and liberal programs that promoted war and violence. Quote, the most baffling paradox today is the, attitude, is the attitude of men toward war. On the one hand, we have the advocates of radical reform, insisting that the only path to this era of peace and justice is through violent revolution. On the other hand, we have advocates of the present system insisting that they can only ensure peace by worldwide preparation for the same kind of war, which recently took, play, took the lives of 10 million men, end quote. Both scenarios, he, he maintained, were catastrophic for American Blacks living under racial subjection because they would become little more than pawns, peons, and victims. Further, a proletariat that preached violence and force ultimately became a tool of capitalism by neglecting its historical duty to organize and unite as a class against the owners of capital. In this way, his admonishment of warmongering con uh, constituted a larger critique of capitalist accumulation and anti-radicalism. According to his logic, it was not communism, but rather greed and reaction in the guise of patriotism that was a violent threat. This murderous masquerade aimed to eliminate not only purported enemies, but also, but also those who expressed any opposition to racist exploitation. Thus, by the time Du Bois proclaimed in, in 1947 that, quote, the emancipation of the black masses of the world is one guarantee of a firm foundation in world peace, end quote, he had already convincingly established the rootedness of peace in a larger program of human emancipation. As the United States increased war expenditures, trained young men for murder, jailed peace proponents, and barred foreign peace advocates from entering the country, Du Bois doubled down on his peace efforts. Peace conferences held in, Rome, in Paris, Rome, Bombay, and Prague were overshadowed by the threat of nuclear war. In response, Du Bois and a small cadre of progressives founded the Peace Information Center in April 1950 to spread knowledge about the peace movement that was burgeoning across the world and to promote friendship and cooperation between nations. Their peace activism included opposition to foreign intervention in the Korean Civil War, the exclusion of China from the United Nations, the denial of human rights to American Blacks and all oppressed peoples of the world, anti-Black incarceration practices, occupation of the Philippines, and the blaming of the Soviet Union and, communi and communism for all the problems of the world. Members of the Peace Information Center went on, uh, went on speaking tours to raise funds and to cultivate progressive networks of support. They spoke for meetings and organizations, including uh, the American Labor Party, the Furriers Union, the Progressive Party of LA, uh, the National Council of American and Soviet uh, Friendship, and the Civil Rights Congress. The center also distributed a bi-weekly periodical called Peacegram to furnish facts about councils, activities, demonstrations, and petitions that were being organized against the threat of war. They also published leaflets, including the people of the world want peace and the, the Negro people speak of peace to provide an alternative narrative to the rampant war propaganda of the US government. 
Most importantly, they helped to circulate the Stockholm Peace, uh, Peace Appeal, also known as the Ban the Bomb Petition. This document emerged in March 1950 out of a worldwide consensus that called for an outlining of atomic weapons, international con controls to enforce the measures, and the treatment of any country that had used the atomic bomb <laughs> as war criminals that had committed crimes against humanity. And of course, at that time, the only, at that time, then and now, the only country to drop an atomic bomb is the United States. Um, Doxy Wilkerson noted, quote, the peace petitions and declarations circulated by, by the Peace Information Center caught on in a big way among the people of our country. They helped give rise here to a powerful upsurge for peace. Dr. Du Bois and his associates are bright symbols of the widespread opposition of the US people to the war drive of the Truman administration, end quote. I'm gonna skip this part. Um, so Du Bois' peace offensive in the, in the Peace Information Center, um, and during, so he, I had a part about him running for the Senate. He ran for the Senate in 1950, but, I want to save time for other things. So um, anyway, so so his peace offensive and um, his Senate campaign illuminate, illuminated his investment in black liberation and social, socialism, no longer looking to the talented tenth to ensure progress. He put his faith and efforts in the masses of workers, especially the racialized, colonized and otherwise oppressed who are dedicated to a peaceful, free, equitable and just world. OK, so now I want to shift to a discussion of this piece called uh, Lenin in Africa. And this was published in a Soviet newspaper called, uh, I'm going to mess this up, but it's uh, Sovre Menyi Vostok in February 1959. Um, so he opens saying, quote, the African tribe was always and still mainly is a commune, a socialist organization where all capital goods belong to the tribe, where work and trade were directed by the tribe, and where at times and places the chief was a, dic a dictator, yet for the most part, power was in the hands of a tribal council to which all adults belonged. The Soviet Union might point out that its great leader, Lenin, had Africa as well as Europe in mind when he established the great communist nation. I do not know of any passages in the writings of Lenin which refer specifically to, uh, to Africa, but I do know that his doctrines uh, must be a guide to this continent if it hopes to stand before the present conspiracy against it on the part of the United States, Britain, Germany, France, and Belgium. So here he's not only thinking, he's Having, he's offering up an expansive understanding of socialism as not just the domain of, of Europe, but as also endemic in African practices and, and African ways of organizing, even if they didn't call it communism or impose it as a global system. And he's also saying that in the post-colonial moment, Black, the, you know, these African nations have to think about a socialist mode of organizing or they're going to be <laughs> subjected to neocolonialism and imperialism, which is ultimately uh, what we see today. So I want to take a slight detour and connect Lenin to Du Bois's writing about World War I and imperialism. So Du Bois has this particular analysis of imperialism and war in his piece called The African Roots of War, um, published in 1915, that resonates a lot with Lenin's notion of imperialism. And so they're writing roughly at the same time. Um, the related but distinct analyses of, of uh, World War I offered by Lenin and Du Bois demonstrate how, because Du Bois was firmly rooted in the tradition of radical blackness, um, this allowed him to combine both black liberation and socialism. In a piece called The Proletarian Revolution and the Renegade Kautsky, Lenin wrote the following about World War I. Quote, the imperialist war of 1914 to 1918 is a war between two groups of imperialist bourgeois, uh, bourgeoisies for the division of the world, for the division of booty and for the appraisal uh, for the plunder and strangulation of small nations. This was the appraisal of the impending war give, um, given in the, the, the Basel Manifest of 1912, and it has been confirmed by the facts, end quote. This analysis is, is remarkably similar to that of Du Bois in the African Roots of War. Du Bois's articulation, however, is distinct in that racism, white supremacy, and the plunder of Africa feature prominently. For Du Bois, as Berlin sought its place in the sun and aimed to displace London in particular, the imperialist rivalry for the booty on offer in Africa drove the conflict. Both men agreed that World War I was a function of capitalism, capitalism's historical development. 
Um, however, Du Bois expanded Lenin's conception by critiquing the anti-African foundations of, of capitalist expansion. He held that the struggle to the death during the Great War for African resources and labor had already begun to pay dividends centuries earlier through the enslavement of African peoples, the subsequent conflation of color and inferiority, and the reduction of what was routinely referred to as a dark continent to a space of backwardness and um, to a space of backwardness ideally suited for plunder and dispossession. Regarding the winners and losers of World War I, Lenin assessed, quote, the present war is on the part of both groups of the belligerent powers an imperialist war, i.e. one waged by the capitalists for the division of the profits obtained from world domination, for the, for the finance baking capital, for the subjugation um, of the weaker nationalities, etc. Du Bois concurred, concurred that, quote, with the waning possibility of big fortune at home arose, magnificent, arose magnificently the dreams of exploitation abroad, end quote. But he added the caveat that by the 20th century, white labor also sought to share, also sought to share in the, quote, golden stream of racialized expropriation. He called this democratic despotism, and this allowed for the white working class to quote share the spoil um, to share in the spoils of exploiting um, chinks and niggers, end quote, which implicated not simply the ruling class, but the entire nation itself, rooted in the notion of democracy that united capital and labor, and that perpetuated racial capitalism across class lines. While Lenin claimed, quote, each day of war enriches the financial and industrial bourgeoisie and impoverishes and saps the strengths of the proletariat and peasantry of all the belligerents, as well as the neutral countries, end quote, Du Bois noted that the disrespect and dehumanization of racialized toilers and peasants in the plundered colonies actually mitigated the exploitation and impoverishment of the white working class in imperial nations. Um, this super exploitation allowed white workers to get a share, however pitiful, of wealth, power, and luxury on a scale that the world had never seen before, and to benefit from the new wealth accumulated from the darker nations of the world through, class, uh, through cross class consent for governance by white folks and economic subject, subjugation to them, a consensus solidified through the doctrine of the natural inferiority of most men to the few. Furthermore, while Du Bois affirmed Lenin's contention that, quote, it is impossible to slip out of the imperialist war and achieve a democratic, non-coercive peace without overthrowing the power of capital and transferring state power to another class, the proletariat, end quote, Du Bois elaborated, our duty is clear, racial slander must go, racial pre uh, prejudice will follow. He continued, quote, the domination of one people by another without the other's consent, be the subject people black or white, must stop. The doctrine of forcible economic expansion over people must go, end quote. In other words, a dictatorship of the proletariat must be, be complemented, uh, or excuse me, must be committed to the complete eradication of racial hierarchy. The latter did not automatically follow from the former. For Du Bois then, it was not simply the proletariat, but also the darker peoples and nations of the world who would challenge the racial capitalism, or who would challenge racial capitalism and its constitutive technologies of imperialism, colonialism, and war. This included Japan, China, India, and Egypt, in addition to the 25 million grandchildren of the European slave trade, and first of all, the 10 million Black folk in the United States. So again, here we see an analysis of imperialism that really parallels that of Lenin, but because his locus of enunciation is the conditions of Black and African people, he comes to a slightly different and um, some might argue a more robust analysis of um, these intersectional like structures of domination. Returning to Lenin in Africa, Du Bois wrote, quote, the rise of the Soviet Union um, under the leadership of Lenin was feared in America as a threat to her exploitation in Africa. She especially warned her citizens of African descent to avoid communism. But Paul Robeson expressed his faith in the Soviet Union and his belief that Negroes would, would never fight a war against her. For this, he was nearly lynched at Peekskill and for 10 years refused uh, the right to sing and travel abroad, end quote. So I was gonna talk about peak skill, but I won't talk about that. But essentially Du Bois is arguing here that, so when I talked earlier about the intersections of anti-blackness and anti-communism, he is describing this happening, um, this is trying, the attempt of the United States as an, as an imperial power to not only sort of inculcate this in US society, but also to impose it on the African continent. This is also, anti-communism is also one of the key reasons why the United States was very closely aligned to South Africa, despite sort of global protests that had been circulating against apartheid, the US had to make um, the decision, or chose to make the decision to align with, with South Africa because it was a, a sort of bad 
bastion of anti-communism. Um, and so I can talk about uh, Peace on the Q&A if you all want to hear about it. It's a really interesting story. But um, OK, so in Lenin in Africa, Du Bois continues, quote, after the Second World War, when the Soviet Union had free civilization from the menace of Hitler, the people of America drew near to the great communist state and studied more seriously the teaching of Lenin. Negroes renewed the Pan-African Congress, long suspended, and at the bidding of young Africans like uh, Nkrumah, turned towards socialism. This was one of the, the causes for the great business interests of America to begin a huge propaganda against communism and the doctrine of Lenin. They poured millions of dollars into the campaign and accompanied some efforts to lighten discrimination against Negroes with dismissal of Negroes from jobs if they showed any sympathy for socialism or for the Soviet Union, or if they attended any meetings of liberals or subscribed to a liberal or communist publication. He goes on to say that African leaders uh, were much more fortunate than US Blacks in their knowledge of the work of Lenin. He cites Kwame Nkrumah as an example who identified himself in his autobiography as a Marxist socialist associated with, um, and, and who, who I, so okay, in his biography, Kwame Nkrumah described himself as a, a Marxist socialist. Um, he described his association with the Communist Party while in London. And he also had George Padmore, who was a former member of the Comintern as one of his closest advisors. Um, du Bois also mentions Namdi Azikiwe, who he called the most intelligent leader of Nigeria, um, and mentioned that he has spent some time in the Soviet Union, um, and that Azikiwe had, had known of Lenin's work. And so what's important here is that the Fifth Pan-African Congress is argu arguably one of the most important Pan-African Congresses. It was the most radical of the five, which are there's a Pan-African Conference in 1900, but then there's Pan-African Congresses in 1919, 1921, 1923, and 1927. Huge gap, then there's 1945. And this one is really important because it manifested radical anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism and really centered the importance of strikes, boycotts, and workers' power to the end of colonialism. And so it was a, a difference in orientation from previous conferences, which had emphasized um, petitioning the League of Nations for gradual um, self-determination in the colonies. So um, to conclude with Lenin in Africa, Du Bois notes that missionaries, teachers, church leaders, and foreign businesses were, were spreading propaganda against Lenin and the Soviet Union throughout Ghana, South Africa, the Congo, and other parts of the continent. Um, he said further that since the signs of efforts at independence and federation in Africa and after Nkrumah's visit to America and after French Guinea declared that its independence from France and its union with Ghana, increased efforts were being made to induce Africa to borrow from America or Europe and thus to mortgage its future to the capitalist world. The recent conference in Accra uh, was flooded with capitalist agents. At least four American Negroes paid by the State Department uh, were spreading capitalist propaganda. Likewise, Great Britain, the US, France and West Germany were prepared to offer financing for the Volta Dam to implement neo-colonial relations. Given this reality, Du Bois recommended that the Soviet Union should, quote, spread Lenin um, on colonial imperialism to every African colony, end quote, to let them know exactly what type of future they were preparing for. So here again, we see Du Bois articulating the importance of communism and socialism, but again, from an African perspective, that there was something that the Soviet Union had to offer Africans, but that also, you know, the socialization of the African continent was basically um, important to pivoting the world as such away from um, capitalist domination. So um, to conclude, um, in the period spanning the drafting of Black Reconstruction and uh, the petition to join the CPUSA, Du Bois had been active in scores of entities that the House Committee on Un-American Activities um, deemed communist fronts or outright communist. This radicalism elicited a profusion of penalty and punishment. In the midst of anti-communist hysteria, Du Bois was arrested and indicted in 1951. He was abandoned and admonished by the talented tip in which he had placed so much faith uh, for nearly, you know, in the early 20th century and moving forward. Um, and, you know, he was barred from booking events at buildings. He suffered a lot of discrimination, and so did many of his comrades, including um, his wife, Shirley Graham Du Bois, and Paul Robeson, the Jacksons. James Jackson ended up going underground. There's a, just a lot of repression that he faced for, for, um, advocating socialism and black liberation. 
For American authorities and capitalists alike, uh, peace in particular was a foreign and therefore a dangerous concept. Radical Black peace activism was construed as siding with the enemy of the United States and defending peace over the American way of life, effectively, um, which effectively equated advocacy of peace with subversion. Um, so even though um, the Peace Information Center and Du Bois as its chair were indicted as agents of a foreign power, particularly the Soviet Union, they were ultimately acquitted of those charges because the case was very thin. Um, and in general, they, they have been indicted because of their central role in circulating the Stockholm Peace Petition, which people like Dean Atchison and, and, and you know a number of other American officials called a Soviet plot, basically. Um, so during that trial, Du Bois was, the, his abandonment by like the black bourgeoisie was manifested in, in a number of ways. One of which was the fact that one strategy that the lawyers were gonna use was to call character witnesses, but so few prominent blacks were willing to testify that they had to abandon that strategy. Um, he also uh, was having an 83rd birthday during that time, and many uh, prominent Blacks like Mordecai Johnson and Ralph Bunch declined to attend or to sponsor the dinner because they wanted to distance uh, themselves from, from Du Bois because he had the red taint, as they say. Um, so starting in the Black Reconstruction era, Du Bois underwent a steady process of radicalization through which he connected Black liberation and socialism and became even more dedicated to, to the liberation of all persons subjected to racism, uh, class exploitation, colonialism, imperialism, and the threat of nuclear war. In response, counter-revolutionary forces in the government and in uh, conservative and liberal circles attempted to defame, undercut, erase, and criminalize these efforts. Nonetheless, Du Bois weathered the, the repression and reaction and remained a committed freedom fighter, albeit in exile in Accra, Ghana, until his death on August 27, 1963. So. Thank you so much. Well, um, thank you so much for your presentation, Cherise. Um, now we have time, we have around one hour for the QA. Mm. Um, uh, of course, uh, I'm talking here for the, the people who are um, online. Mm -hmm. uh, please feel free to write your questions in the Q&A section. Um, and we already have some questions for you. Okay, great. And of course, uh, well, the people who are here with us uh, at the University of Chicago Center in Paris can ask the question. So maybe we can start with people here and then take the questions on the QA section. Anybody would like to ask anything? <coughs> so can you just uh, introduce yourself yeah. before you start? Henriette, yes. So um, I have a question, a, a big picture a question. So the boy with his uh, red, red paint, mm -hmm. how would he react? How would he assess? How would he, he would uh, support the, the woke, um, the woke uh, movement that we see now? Mm -hmm. um, I think that he would be well. So the the woke. I don't like the terminology woke because I feel like it's a sort of it's become like a pejorative way to refer to people who have developed a particular type of consciousness. I also think that it it can be problematic in and of itself because uh, some of it is rooted in what we call, um, so I'm an organization of Black Alliance for Peace. One of my comrades, Erica Keynes, I think she coined the term, um, identity reductionism. So it's not sort of identity as a, a form, as a one form of politics, but rather identity becomes a politics in and of themselves. And so a lot of the quote unquote woke people um, don't really have a material class or structural analysis It's simply a sort of um, an identitarian, um, an identitarian politic that I don't know that Du Bois would support. It depends on which Du Bois we're thinking about, because as um, I didn't speak very much about, but as I try to convey, Du Bois goes through many sort of ideological shifts over time. And it's not linear, but he moved more and more toward 
specifically the Communist Party as time went on. And so perhaps 1903 Souls of Black Folk, Du Bois, who focused much more on um, a particular type of racial consciousness may have been supportive of particular types of identity politics. I think that not, you know, older octogenarian Du Bois and maybe slightly early will be supportive of persons who are at least grappling with the or taking seriously the idea of socialism um, and the necessity of socialism for not only um, economic democracy, but also for um, in relationship to climate change, right? And so I think that some a really important and interesting development is the focus on climate and climate disaster and how capitalism is responsible <laughs> for much of uh, global warming and environmental degradation. And so uh, to make a short story long, as I always say, I think that on the one hand, he would caution young people that state repression is real and that there is a cost to having particular types of values in politics. But I also think that he would feel that woke, particular types of woke politics are necessary because how else are we going to struggle for the world that we need <laughs> to build if it's going to be uh, sustainable? So. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, please. Can I ask my question? Sure. Th thanks, thanks very much. Thank you, Sharice, for the presentation. It was great. Um, I have a question about sort of socialism versus liberation. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious how helpful, in, in retrospect, <clears throat> how helpful was socialism as a goal for Du Bois versus just liberation? Mm -hmm. It strikes me that liberation as a goal seems easier, not easier to attain, but easier maybe to, to define. Or, mm -hmm. Seems like it's more motivating thing where socialism because you know there's so many varieties and it, it, and really are we looking is, is socialism really the goal or is liberation the goal? Mm -hmm. The question is, do you, do you see Du Bois's dependency on socialism as being like, that's really helpful? Mm -hmm. Or if he had had another kind of piece, I'm going to aim for liberation. Would that have been easier? Not necessarily easier, easier, but better, more effective. Mm -hmm. Well, the question is liberation from what, right? And to what? And so I think that socialism is one way of, of answering that question. That's that's the to what. Um, and it's, you know, and liberation from what, if it is that cap capitalist exploitation or super exploitation in the case of racialized or um, racialized persons or those subjected to um, colonialism, if economics is a foundation of that, if not the central foundation, then socialism or some sort of system beyond capitalism becomes vitally necessary. So the question is, can you have a program of liberation, right? Liberation in a, in a sort of totalizing sense that is against all structures of domination without socialism being some aspect of that. I don't think for Du Bois, it was the only thing, um, but I think that it was a central in terms of how he understood colonial domination, imperial domination, war, um, and, and racism and its anti-Black and other varieties, because of the central ways that politics and economics uh, played into those, socialism was central. Now, whether it was a Soviet variety or a Chinese variety or a Cuban variety or something that he identified in the African context, um, he oscillated between these, but I think some sort of e economic democracy broadly conceived, some sort of um, transformative redistribution of wealth and resources was vitally necessary to any program of liberation, whether it's the anti-colonial liberation movement. So that's what he's trying to convey in Lenin in Africa, that to know precisely what the continent is up against, there must be some understanding of um, Science, at least scientific socialism as a methodology, but also what it means to be reinscribed into the capitalist system. When it comes to the role of Black people um, in the United States, um, it can't just be race. It can't just be a racial insurgency because of intra-racial class dynamics, and intra-racial class conflict. There has to be some sort of economic collectivism, which in, again, in the 1930s, he was very much advocating. So all of that to say, I think some type of socialism was vital to his understanding of liberation. And again, there were different varieties that he studied and that he um, 
advocated at different moments, but I think it's important. Yeah. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Jennifer from New York City originally, and I'm a huge fan of your work. You're not Thank supposed you. to say that in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Here I am. Um, anyhow, so thank you so much. I've been watching your YouTube videos. <laughs> <laughs> so I have so many questions, but to pick one, um, when it comes to I've been sort of following debates around identity reductionism, race reductionism, class reductionism, mm -hmm. all of these splinters and um, just thinking about the long history of the way in which um, uh, whites have always blocked integration around class struggle in the U.S. So mm -hmm. I think of like 1918, just very briefly, there was a big union vote, mm -hmm. the white union voted by two, it was like 218 to 216 or something, not to conjoin with the black union mm -hmm. at the time. So this is AFL. I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. It has to be. Cause... Yeah, this has been right. <laughs> um, well. So, you know, we see why one of these, you know, some reason people think in terms of these splinters, but do you see any constructive ways forward in terms of these different reductionisms and discourse in the United States, which is just so problematic, and yet we have to navigate through it in mm -hmm. some way? Well, my answer is internationalism. I think this is why internationalism is vitally important because the U.S. left is to the right of virtually every other left in the world and so if it's if it's only u.s centered we're not going to get very far because of the it's there's no america is not exceptional but america is peculiar in the ways that race and capitalism operate and to the comparatively late capitalist hegemony hegemony it took on after world war one right so capitalism was already a developed system but their particular capitalist leadership number one because of the the history of settler colonialism enslavement and genocide is is all always already shot through with both anti-radicalism and and racism um and so we are we being the united states it is a right-wing country period even in its most liberal the liberal the liberalism between roughly 1945 and 1974 is a deviation if you think about it it's a young nation too to you know, 200, 250 years old, um, not that good at math, but um, but in that period, 1945 to to 1974 is what less than 30 years. That's the sort of the most progressive era. It's all of that to say. So I think that internationalism, linking up with other um, organizations, other movements beyond the U.S. and even beyond the Americas, is vitally important. And whether that is, is trans, transnational, that is to say through organizations or international, that is to say through um, capturing the state in particular areas and then linking up with like places like Venezuela or Cuba or um, other places. Well, you know, I try not to say too much because <laughs> <laughs> I, I need to be able to re-enter the country. But um, yeah, so I think, um, I think that that's at least one way uh that's one way and i would really i'm always really interested in what white people would say to this question because i feel like racialized people are always asked this over and over but it it's really a question for the white majority in the united states like when <laughs> when do you, when when are you ready to sort of organize across you know um across race lines as opposed to across class lines because it's it historically it's been um cross class collaboration as opposed to um interracial um collaboration in general so that's all I got <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation mm -hmm. because I think you made us understand how much chronology is important mm -hmm. in order to understand Du Bois' mm -hmm. evolution and thoughts. Um, regarding the uh, Black Reconstruction uh, era, mm -hmm. okay, for Du Bois, um, he, he uh, advocates for um, a desired segregation okay. uh, but ultimately what does he want with that uh, so we have two nations mm -hmm. the socialist one mm -hmm. the capitalist one the white one the black one 
So they are evolving in different directions. Mm -hmm. You talked about the, the government and the fact that black leaders were part of the uh, federal government. Mm -hmm. but, but ultimately, what does he have in mind? Uh, he thinks that the black nation can influence the white nation and, and destroy, eradicate capitalist exploitation. Is it what he has in mind? I think he has in mind the eradication of black suffering and the ability of this very sort of subjugated people to have some um, hope for some, some aspect of human flourishing, right? I think that it's sort of like, it's not going to come from the government. It's not going to come from the, the labor movement. Now, it's the 1930s is very important because this is just one he comes sort of comes out of that phase of analysis, but this is the 1930s This is the Great Depression. This is when there was there's the vitriolic racism, the labor movement uh, resurges. There's there's many things happening because it's also the founding of the CIO is happening as well and the, the National Negro Congress, etc. So there there are some progressive interracial um, move or interracial organizing happening on the one hand, but then there's also like the rise of a U.S. brand of fascism that's happening, quite frankly, pre predominantly, especially in the South. There's there's racism within, um, you know, the white labor movement, as I mentioned. There's the the extremely racist application of the of New Deal policies, so that the the not complete exclusion, but the marginalization of black people, especially black farmers, for example, in New Deal policy. So, what is the alternative? And so, I don't know that he's even thinking about. Um, a, a broader, you know, influence, then maybe the blacks will influence whites to be socialists. I don't know if it was that, but I think it's more so like, how do we, if this, if he's still thinking about a project of racial uplift, how do we do that? Right? Because it certainly can't be through black capitalism, because number one, black people are broke. And number two, uh, capital, black capitalism is still exploitation. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to going to read a few questions you know, from the Q&A section uh, on Zoom. Um, okay, from Anthony Alps. Thank you so much for your brilliant talk. Um, I have one quick clarification question and two more substantial questions if I may. First question. Uh, what was the title of the conference in 1933 you talked about uh, in the first part of your presentation? You Second like Amenia Conference. Second Amenia Conference? Second Amenia Conference, okay. yes. Thank you. And then, uh, why did you choose um, 1937 as the year to mark, to mark the end of Du Bois' Black Reconstruction era? Mm -hmm. I mean, could you perhaps stretch the periodization to include something like Dusk of Dawn uh, in uh, uh, published in uh, 1940, which continued to deal with some of the issues you outlined, such as the such as co operative commonwealths. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you could. You can expand it. It's fungible. These are all like arbitrary distinctions. Um, there is a particular piece that he writes in 1937 that shows a sort of renewed faith in the possibility of interracial organizing, but it's an arbitrary distinction. So sure. 1931 and 1940. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Another question. Uh, what role do you see Du Bois's uh, first-hand exper experience of German fascism uh, right after the publication of Black Reconstruction play in possibly connecting the Black Reconstruction era and this radical Black disactivism era? Yeah. So I think that what it there was a profound. Um, sympathy for the Jewish situation because he even says that the exploitation that he was or the the vitriolic suppression of Jews that he was seeing at the time that he was in Germany was even worse than what blacks were experienced and he, he had worked in the south <laughs> in like you know so so I think that there was a sort of a it opened up or it sort of just maybe underscored the nature of the global nature of exploitation and the need to eradicate all of these different forms of oppression and the way you know and you know i think the ways that nationalism forms of backward parochial nationalism can create um these 
manifold forms of suffering, especially targeted at groups who can easily be blamed or scapegoated for economic or and political and social duress. Um, and so I think that sort of plays into his international look on the one hand, but also his deep ambivalence about what's possible, the types of organizing that are, po are um, possible in the United States across racial lines, right? Because he's seeing on the one hand, this one form of, of a, a white nationalist suppression and the resurgence of a white nationalist suppression here. And so I think that he's thinking of these things together. Okay. Uh, I think you, you wrote in your, um, in your book mm -hmm. um, on Du Bois mm -hmm. um, that he, he went to the University of Berlin uh, from um, 1892 to 1894, mm -hmm. if I remember well. Uh, so when, you are, when you're talking about uh, the anti-Semitism mm -hmm. Semitism that he he saw in uh, Germany. Are you? That's in the 1930s. So he went on a trip to Germany in the 1930s. And so okay. when he came back from that trip, okay. when he came back from studying in Berlin in the 1890s, this I think that this sparked his initial interest in socialism. So of course, the Boys is a member of the Socialist Party from 1909 to 1910, but the Socialist Party does not take race seriously. So he ended up he ends up leaving the Socialist Party also to, to vote for Woodrow Wilson, which he later regretted. But I think that that initial moment in Germany is what exposed him to because at that time Germany had the most developed socialist movement and so I so so yes this is the 1930s period when he returned for um, a visit. Um, any other question here? Yes please. Uh, hello I'm also with Gregory in the Center of Socialism in the US. Um, thank you so much for could you speak up, please, Kelly? Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, I was saying that I'm also with Gregory in the organization of this seminar. Um, at some point in your presentation, you mentioned um, uh, the cooperation of uh, Black cooperatives mm -hmm. the, and other groups. And today, with all the discussion you mentioned here uh, going on in the US with the race, class reductionism, mm -hmm. and all the uh, all the difficulties that we see in putting different groups together, like fighting for, uh, you know, like what we would call black liberation mm -hmm. um, and other working class groups. Um, how uh, did that cooperation um, for Du Bois, um, well, how did Du Bois thought that cooperation would happen? What were the terms of the cooperation and how could, you know, like, um, between the uh, black cooperatives and the progressive and working class groups could happen. Mm -hmm. Well, so in the 1930s, he's thinking along the pragmatic segregation lines. And so for him, he thought that the way that the sort of black cooperative economic organization would happen is through training and through the leadership through a sort of leadership cadre who would be exceptionally trained and then who would you know, um, be at the forefront of developing the cooperatives and then training other black people in the ways of um, cooperative economics. Um, he thought business leaders were essential, but again, a retrained business class that's not owning businesses for profit, but rather to serve the community. And so, but I also think that even the, the basis of a lot of black nationalism is not um, autarky but building up the group to a level of strength whereby you can come together with other groups on an equal footing right so you have a sort of coherent a group coherence and but also political and economic power that allows you to participate in the national system or the global system on equal footing um and so i i think it's about how do we educate, politically develop, economically develop, and, and um, socially organize Black people to stop being seen and understood as the pariahs of society and to also break relations of dependence that come from systems like sharecropping, tenancy. Um, and so I, I think that he's also thinking along those lines, not in a, not in a closed society way, but like, how do we help ourselves so that we, we can join this sort of 
um, broader struggle against, you know, capitalism, imperialism, et cetera. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any other question? But when it comes to internationalism, mm -hmm. um, there is a huge gap between the goals of the goal mm -hmm. is to destroy capitalism mm -hmm. and, and the, the mean is thinking about, which is this uh, alliance mm -hmm. uh, between uh, all the victims of mm -hmm. white capitalism. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, right after the Second World War, uh, of course, China is extremely upset against Japan. Mm -hmm. okay. there, is also, there is also racial hierarchy in Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, what do you think about that? Does he, does he talk about this? Uh, is he, of course, he's aware of it. Mm -hmm. he, went, uh, he went to, I think, to China. I mean, mm -hmm. So of course, he saw uh, what happened, mm -hmm. what the Japanese did. So how does he, how can he think that such a, an international transnational alliance is possible, mm -hmm. taking, taking into consideration uh, all, the, all the consequences of the past? Mm -hmm. Well, the Bandung Conference happened in 1955. That's true. So, you know, and that include, it included a wealth of, of African and Asian nations. And so how did you, you get all, you know, all racisms, all forms of imperialism and imposition need to be eradicated. Interestingly enough, Japan was like, prior to 1945, Japan was looked at by many Black and African groups as a sort of, as a lot, as the, the, the leader of the colored nations because Japan had proved, you know, a challenge to white supremacy. And so these, you know, his, as we know, like, you know, history is not stagnant. And so the way that people, that nations and groups and people navigate oppression on the one hand and victimization on the other certainly shifts over time. Right. And I think it's a, sim it's one could think similarly about, for example, like Barack Obama and the way that, he as a, a black individual symbolized something about progress for black people and by extension racialized people so throughout the world he was this sort of figure of progress at the same time that he is one of the most imperial president presidents of the united states the the, the you know droner in chief as they say and so it's these tensions always persist but you had the non-aligned movement, you had the Bang, Bandung movement, you had the tricontinental movement, the third world is movement. So there, it's happening all the time and we can't conflate the people with the policy of the state or national leaders, even though they like to narrate it that way. And so I think that those contradictions are always there, but the possibilities are happening all the time. Okay. You know, I'm gonna read a question by Lyndon Smith. Um, at this point, it's impossible to separate the intertwined actions of imperialism, white supremacy, and capitalism. Mm -hmm. We see it impact South America, North American racialized people, Palestine, and African countries at the ends of imperial projects. How, at this point, <clears throat> do we organize to end these levers of aggression when A, they are so entrenched in every aspect, aspect of of our existence today and be more people accept them as normal than those that don't don't well i disagree with the last point i don't think that more people accept them as normal than those who don't you know i think that people are struggling all the time people are challenging all the time it's just that um history is told by the victors right and right now the media the way that our history is written um how epistemology that is to say how we come to know we know it's controlled by the victors that is to say the imperialists and the capitalists who have power but i think if we look at the majority of the world i don't know that the majority of the world is invested in capitalism and imperialism i think that we all participated in it because of the global nature of the structures but um yeah so so you know again these these things are happening all these movements these forms of macro and micro counter hegemony and rejection are happening all of the time in terms of what to do 
Oh no. <laughs> we like I I as I always say, I have no solutions. I'm just trying to understand the problem. But I do, you know, um, and it's not really up to to me. I think I'm doing my part by trying to engage in this anti-imperial, anti-colonial, anti-capitalist scholarship. There are organizations that are engaging in mutual aid. There are, you know internationalist conferences that are happening all the time where people are trying to link up their various movements to um, consolidate and, and manifest a uh, popular front, so to speak, against these structures. So I think, you know, it's happening, like counterinsurgencies are happening um, all around us. But, you know, at, at a particular historical moment, people thought slave, like, you know, racial slavery was going to be forever. It was not, but it, it has to do with the correlation of forces and with sort of, and with um, popular struggle. So um, I think all of those things need to continue to happen. Um, if we look at the 1960s, the 1960s was a moment of profound optimism because capital and colonialism was like on its heels, right? Uh, we're not in that moment. Um, capital reconstituted, <laughs> imperialism rebounded in a major way, but it's not forever. Look at the global crises that are happening all the time and more and more people are being left out and being treated like the colonized, being treated like the blacks, right? And so that has the potential to raise consciousness and to build particular movements, but those movements can be fascism. <laughs> those popular movements can be even more right wing. So, you know, Stuart Hall talks about like Marxism without guarantees. There are no guarantees to what these struggles will look like, but they're happening all the time. But I don't have any profound solutions. If I did, I would be dead. The U.S. kills the people that have the profound solutions. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, please. Um, I'm a, also a member of uh, Kennedy's uh, seminar. I had a question about Du Bois' trip to the USSR. Mm -hmm. uh, why did he go? How did he stay there? Uh, and what did he think when he came back? Mm -hmm. Did he write anything uh, particular about this trip? And what was his uh, analysis of uh, the Soviet situation? Mm -hmm. I think he went. He went in 1926. I want to say he went for he went for several months. I can't remember exactly how long. He did write about he wrote about it so he in his the autobiography of wb du bois he actually starts with his trip to the soviet he actually starts with analysis of the soviet union that includes information about that 1926 trip because of course he went back in the 1950s um and his analysis was he was stunned and thrilled by what was happening that that because the u.s like right you can like stalin or not it was the fastest industrialized industrializing country in the world, right? And so he was amazed at what he was seeing. He did not believe, but he did not believe that the Bolshevik or the Soviet model of organizing applied to US blacks. And so he said that, you know, if the eradication, if the raise, the raising the standard of living, if, if the eradication of racial oppression and the, you know, and um, the forms of cooperation he was seeing is, Bolshevism, I'm Bolshevik. That's what he says, right? Um, but he also understood the, the importance of contextual, historical, and material conditions. And so that was not what he saw to be possible for Black people. So um, if you go to the Du Bois papers and just type in Soviet Union, <laughs> drafts of his speeches and writings about that period will come up, but it's 1926. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is it, is it correct to say that uh, Du Bois was never an advocate of violence? Yeah. yeah. So, so this is why some people question if he was a Marxist, like, but, and I think it's kind of like Oliver Cromwell Cox, who is somebody who's a very important thinker to my own work, but it's like, I think Du Bois was a Du Boisian, but I think that, but he did not, ever agree with the overthrow of the government by force or violence. And many people, including Herbert Aptheker, argue that he remained, and, and John Henry Clark and others, like argue that he remained profoundly an idealist, right? But had a historical materialist or a scientific socialist analysis of what was. But no, he was never, 
he abhor like he he said he writes about this like I abhor violence right and this is part this undergirds his, his peace activism um but he also understood that peace was not the absence of conflict it was all of those things that I mentioned right the eradication of imperialism of colonialism of equality and justice all of, and that requires a particular type of struggle um yeah but he he was not a he was not a violence person, I don't think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you say anything about, um, you know, you talked about how he had this evolution of not linear and more and more in, towards communism. Mm -hmm. And could you say anything about that and with respect to today, you know, uh, and today with the US situation? Because mm -hmm. um, communism's got to be one of the most uh, suppressed, um, uh, most distorted words in the US political discourse. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, if we look throughout the entire history of humanity, arguably, very much, you know, it depends how you define communism, right? but very much a successful small scale society was communist, mm -hmm. uh, millennia, millennia, millennia. So, but today, you know, um, how did Du Bois get to that conclusion? And in what way does that hold for us today? Mm -hmm. Well, that's the other thing about so Du Bois is often understood as like this great individual like historical figure, but what's really important about his evolutions and thinking that he always belonged to organizations. He was always studying and reading and trying to figure out like the fuck are we going to do? <laughs> like really he was like I think that and that's why so some people call him like contradictory, hypocritical, but he really is just trying to figure it out in real time, period. And so for him, as he, you know, he talks about his autobiography, as he talks about in his letter to join the Communist Party, it's after diligent study that he came to the, the, the rea reality or idea, whatever, that communism was the way to eradicate the social ills that have persisted for decades, because he tried a whole bunch of stuff from like the talent of 10th right he th there was all sorts of things that he he advocated and believed in um and I, I wouldn't even say tried on in a sort of dismissive way but he thought might be a solution but over time he just i think that the e he came more and more to the conclusion that the economic situation was really the crux of of human liberation but also not necessary mm, but that racialized people had to be at the center of that people who are subjected to colonial colonialism and imperialism had to be at the center of under of not only analysis but the efforts at refashioning a world right and so um and i think that we're going through like a similar time because i i do think <laughs> communism is still like anathema right so people say like i'm an anti-capitalist or i'm a socialist or i'm a leftist but very few people say they're a communist because we're still very close to the end of the Cold War, right? Um, but I do think that more and more people are coming to the types of thinking and the types of questions that also were rooted in Du Bois's transformations or Du Bois's sort of moves in thinking, where it's like, so are we all going to starve? <laughs> like, what do we mean by freedom? Freedom to die, you know? And and what does it take for the majority? to have a lot, not just the minority, right? And I think that these are the types of questions that lead to some sort of collective understanding, whether you call it communism, whether you call it socialism, you know, communalism or whatever, it is something, it, it has to start there. I think that the other thing that needs to be taken into account um, though is, is environmentalism. And I don't think the types of socialism the, the commanding height socialism that constituted the Soviet Union is sustainable. So, and this is where, why the, I think the great leap or the Chinese model was, was very attractive to other largely peasant, largely agrarian societies that were adapting different types of socialism because modernization and developmentalism is unsustainable. And so I think that as we think about like political and economic democracy, we also have to think about sustainability and ultimately, um land back <laughs> gotta give a whole lot of things back to to groups and so um i don't know if that answered your question but oh, that's a lot yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
I mean, I won't go to the follow up, mm -hmm. but maybe it's going a bit too far. But I just, you know, I don't know how much you study the European context, but it's, you know, it's interesting to compare the two and, and the ways in which these things are playing out mm -hmm. in terms of vision. It seems like, you know, there's historical blinders on, on all sides mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. when it comes to moving forward. Um, but uh, certainly within the US, there's um, there are, there's examples under different terms now of transition. Uh, this cooperation Jackson, you know, there's mm -hmm. a different area around him. DJ Kelly with that book, great book, Hammer and Ho, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of the history, but um, anyway. Um, I don't know exactly what my question is. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I think that one of the real sort of consequences of, of anti communism and the way that internationalism was construed as a communist plot or was disciplined as much as communism and socialism were is, is these blinders. And so there was a re, so in the context of the United States, there's a renationalization, for example, of civil rights. The discourse shifts from sort of human rights to civil rights. And human rights becomes codified in this very liberal individualist term. And so I think that that, that repression accounts for some of those blinders, like movements not studying each other or really focusing on just the, the national or the very, very hyper localized realities. Um, along with the cultural turn, which I won't get into that. But so I think, you know, I think that we're just in a moment of, of rebuilding. Um, we have to look forward as much as we look back because we're just in a profoundly new situation. I think that we have to take into account mechanization, um, the rise of social media, the very, very integrated, but also fragmented and disjointed nature of our world. Um, so I think Du Bois is somebody who's important to consider and to think with, along with like Walter Rodney and, you know, manifold other people, Franz Fanon, Claudia Jones, et cetera. But we also have to, we can't get, we also have to look forward um, to what, it is that we want because we it's easy it's easier to be anti-imperial anti-capital anti-colonial etc but it's like what do you want to build right what is the other side to that so yeah and i think that's also something du bois was profoundly grappling with sometimes just throwing stuff at the wall <laughs> like you know so yeah so we still have around 20 minutes for q a uh i have two questions to read from people well, online, but I wanted to encourage the people who are online to ask questions before uh, we run out, run out of time. So, uh, and before I get these questions, I had one question to ask you, mm -hmm. Charisse. Um, I wanted you to uh, expand on um, what um, uh, the voice uh, pulls about um, the way African American communists, uh, I mean, member of the, the CPUSA, like Harry Haywood or mm -hmm. people like him, um, James Ford and others, um, the way they, what he thought about the way they frame uh, what they call the Negro question mm -hmm. in the United States, um, um, the black belt pieces mm -hmm. and the yeah, the way they frame the question of self-determination for what uh, the people they called ne the Negroes at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and also the way, uh, of course, uh, the voice uh, evolved mm -hmm. uh, about this question. Mm -hmm. Well, early on, he was not a fan of the Communist Party. He was not. And if you read the writings of like James Ford, Harry Haywood, Otto Weiswood, in the sort of 1920s and 1930s, they came at Du Bois specifically. They did not like Du Bois. <laughs> they thought he was like a bourgeois Negro misleader. Um, you know, um, Hubert Harrison dragged him um, after he wrote Close Ranks in 1917, 1915. So early on, um, and then there's the, there's a clash that the NAACP had with the International Labor Defense over the Scottsboro Boys, for example. So he was, they were not fans of each other, but, and so there's this argument that Shirley Graham Du Bois, when he became involved with Shirley Graham Du Bois, which is around the 1930s, that she sort of 
more so integrated him in communist circles. And then that's when he began to have a better relationship with people like Esther Cooper, um, who was one of the people, uh, Louis, Louis Burnham. And these are, they were part of the Southern Negro Youth Congress at the time. So they're the people who invited him to give like the Behold the Land speech at their Southern Negro Youth Congress uh, conference. Um, and so I think that over time, and it, but, but there's ways that a ne- the idea of a Negro nation within a nation resonates with the black belt thesis, but I think the difference is what is to be done about it. So I think the analysis and the react the, the way that they understood the analysis that the that anti black oppression is not just discrimination right it's it's a it, ha- it takes on a national character. I think that there was agreements there, but what is to be done about it is was I, I think that they diverge. I don't know that the strategy. Huh? David, the strategy. Know. Yeah. So like what is what is how does one content and if it is that there is national oppression like how, what does one do to ameliorate it or what does one do within that context so um i don't know that he i just i know in in the 1930 the 1920s and 1930s in in uh, like marxism and the negro question i think that especially when it came to the south he thought that the communists profoundly misunderstood the, the racial situation and that communism was kind of like suicide for black people because you is you already black to be black and red was just even worse um i don't know that he ever fully em- embraced the black belt thesis the, the communists even you know abandoned it after a while sort of harry hay would never abandon it he abandoned the party, like well he got kicked out of the party as at the other quote unquote negro nationalists that's another story so anyway so so all of that to say i think um their analysis always seemed to be sort of consonant or parallel, but it's just that the solutions differed, right? And by the time he joined the Communist Party in 1961, they had already moved away from the Back Bell Nation thesis, so. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to read uh, uh, Cecilia Kukemokoko's question. I remember reading a text by Du Bois uh, from the 1930s, I believe, in which he praised American Jews' racial solidarity, Mm -hmm. urging Black Americans to encourage Black businesses uh, the way Jewish Americans uh, vote from Jewish-owned businesses. Would you say Du Bois uh, uh, consistently saw Jewish Americans as a potential model uh, of group empowerment for its own community? Yeah, it is. It's interesting because, you know, Michael, Malcolm X had a similar when Malcolm X was talking about like black Jewish relations. He also said, you know, why hasn't Jewish support manifested in the type of advice of building up economic power? Because this is ultimately what what has sort of maintained and allowed for Jews to overcome particular types of persecution. And so I do think Du Bois was looked at Jews as an ethnic group in the way that they were able to again, to um, navigate political, massive political, very protracted political repression through economic development. But I also think that it's in the in that 1930s moment, he also thought that like black business needed to be retrained, that business business ownership was to the end of communities serving the community and community empowerment, but it could not be exploitative, like it could not be for the 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 acute the building of a, a black exploiter class right that number one black people didn't necessarily have enough capital to do that and number two was ultimately not to their benefit so that's my answer <laughs> uh, another question this is thank you um so uh, another question by Tessabin uh Guidali. Uh, considering Du Bois's uh, argument about the link between anti-racism, the black struggle, and the proletariat struggle in socialism, mm-hmm. considering this merging of struggles in his thoughts, uh, can we consider Du Bois as the father of today's inter- intersectionality? No. <laughs> Could you... Next question. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, interesting question. Um, okay. So Du Bois has this piece of writing called The Black Woman. I think it was, I think it remained unpublished, but 
in it, he wrote it in 1949. And I think that piece was inspired by Claudia Jones's and into the neglects of the problem of the Negro woman, where he talks about the particular types of exploitation that black women face, but also the types of leadership that they offered because of their, um, the, their historical and contemporary situation. So I think Du Bois is not even the father, but Du Bois was one sort of thinker with triple oppression or triple exploitation, which is not intersectionality. Intersectionality comes out of a very particular milieu. And to the extent that intersectionality comes out of legal, out of a sort of legal framework, this is why, at least initially, Class is very underdeveloped in intersectionality because before the law, class is not a protected category, but race and gender are. So if we're looking at Kimberly Crenshaw and what she was arguing for, it was a way that the intersection of race and gender were not recognized before the law. And so Black women had no reprieve before the law as Black women. They had some recourse in terms of affirmative action as women or as Blacks, but not as Black women as such, which is a different project than Du Bois talking about the structural and material conditions of the proletariat generally in the black proletariat particularly. Um, so it's a different epistem epistemological framework and it's a, a different political project. Intersectionality is fine, but I think that what can happen is when we try to create a black women's intellectual tradition, politics, ethics, politics, and epistemology can become conflated. So, you know, we put like a Claudia Jones in conversation with, I don't know, Kamala Harris or whatever black girl magic discourse. And, and I think that the so what is very, very important, right? So what, what, and these are also, you know, anti people who believe in intersectionality don't have to be anti imperialist. And, and all, all, oftentimes they are not, right? And so I just, I think, you know, um, but it, perhaps in other ways, perhaps Du Bois is sort of the gift of Black folk. <laughs> when he talks about Black women and the gift of Black folk, which is a different sort of understanding of Black women's, um, you know, Black women's experience of, of of discrimination and oppression, perhaps that's a precursor to intersectionality. I don't know, but um, I guess the, my answer to that question is I don't know. I just wanted to make the point about the difference between a sort of triple oppression or triple exploitation analysis and intersectionality. At some point, I'm going to write about the sort of there's kind of a shift in discourse from like triple oppression, triple exploitation to um, interlocking structures of domination to jeopardy to intersectionality and these moves happen over time and they matter in terms of what the project becomes so do what you will with that thank you yeah uh, thank you too uh any question yes picking up on the intersectionality thing i'm frank here so I, i've been outside of the u.s now for about 15 years and just for your your personal and professional experiences, I mean, you know, has it gotten any better? Is, it, is there any? You know, do you see optimism, or do you, are you optimistic for things that are happening in the U.S. that make you think, yeah, we're we're, we're making a little bit of progress, maybe we're making a lot of progress? You know, what's gotten better? What's gotten worse for you, just as a as a human being and living in this kind of living in that country as, as mm -hmm. an academic, as a black woman? So. Mm -hmm. You know, Fidel Castro says revolutionaries are always optimistic. So I'm always optimistic. Optimistic about what? Sometimes it is less clear. Um, you know, I think that have things got better? Well, yes and no, right? Um, which is all, you know, always the case. There are more, you know, black women's edu black women are much more educated now than they were previously. There's this argument that black women are the most educated that has a sort of asterisk about it, uh, what that actually means. Um, you know, so, you know, that's that's progress. I do. You know, I think that we see if more representation. That's for many people a huge win, you know, representation and recognition. 
Um, but I think that we're worse off in material terms than we were in 1970. I think there's a way that representation can obfuscate um, working class and poor people's realities. I think that that's where sort of identity reductionism, race reductionism, and then the other side of that is class reductionism can happen. Um, I think we're beginning to be more po like uh, uh, racially and economically polarized as a nation. I think that there's more of an opening for fascist like movements, not only in the United States, but certainly in the United States. And the thing in, in the United the United States is a declining empire. And if it is that we studied empire and the decline of empire, what happens is that when imperialism reaches its asymptote, those structures of domination turn inward. So it's coming. So, you know, the US just, for example, uh, got chased out of Ag Afghanistan. They left, they got chased out. Um, what do you think is gonna happen to all those weapons? Right. We already have a policy of militarizing police. There's also a, a, a strategic uh, pivot to the Indo-Pacific. Um, there is a, a increase, you know, an increased focus on Africa in terms of terrorism. So there's the the, the growth the growth of Africom and Southcom. Um, so you know, um, I don't I don't know that the the scorecards are even, but but. Uh, you know, we we continue. So, a person like me has a job. I think that's something <laughs> <laughs> for now. <laughs> that's a, for now but, you know. Yeah. Um, we still have uh, a few minutes, so we. If anybody would like to ask a question, or or maybe I. I have a final question if uh, nobody wants to bring us home. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, my question was you you talked about the dialectic between black liberation and socialism. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd like you to um, tell us um, more about the dialectic between um, pan Africanism and and, um, and socialism. Mm -hmm. and, uh, about the experience of uh, the boys uh, in Ghana with mm -hmm. uh, Kwame and Kuma. Mm -hmm. well, what would you say about that? Um, well, I think it's important to note that the experience of the boys in Ghana was really as a dignitary, right? So the boys was kind of brought as a, he was more or less a celebrity. He had a very, he had a car. A uh, Russian car, you know. He had a per he had a few personal doctors. You know, he lived in a way that m most Ghanaians did not live. Shirley Graham Du Bois is actually much more important in terms of thinking about the development of Ghana. She she was at a certain point she was put as the head of the um, the, the the TV the the state TV station. She uh, was one of Kwame Nkrumah's uh, close advisors. Uh, to the point where she was expelled from the country in 1966 after the coup. So I think that she's she's actually much uh, she's much more important in terms of, of thinking about how if any of the Du Bois were trying to build socialism, right? But Du Bois, I think Du Bois and Nkrumah's earlier relationship is 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 equally important. Um, they are you know at a number of conferences together, not least in 1945 Pan African Congress, because of course Kwame Nkrumah was educated at Lincoln University. Um, but I think, you know, um, and uh, my comrade Layla can speak much more cogently about the relationship between Black liberation and socialism as a, a member of the AAPRP uh, GC um, um, and the idea of Pan-Africanism as uh, continental unification under the principles of scientific socialism. And so um, do you want to just speak a little bit about Pan-Africanism and socialism? <laughs> <laughs> you should have came. <laughs> um, so it's interesting because I think you, you mean a part of what's really important about that 1945 moment um, is this kind of expense, 
is this shift and this expans an expansion of thinking about panarchism beyond a sort of intellectual or, ide or idealistic project that really does take into consideration the true sort of class positionality of people on the continent. Because mm -hmm. that's also, I think, what's really important about that moment. Not just that class becomes more important, but that, pe that people of African peoples on the continent become very central to the Pan-African struggle in a way that prior to that moment, it was diaspora. primarily diasporic, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I also think, I mean, but what's also interesting is the, the sort of pragmatic sort of materiality of the way Pan-Africanism begins to manifest mm -hmm. under that particular moment. like in some very basic kind of ways, right? Like um, one of the things that was really important for Seko Ture um, in Guinea was that they did away with all copyright laws, right? So it was very important to think about the, the, the spread of information and that it is free and public and accessible to the people, right? Or even these ideas about freedom of movement beyond the sort of colonial borders, um, shared forms of currency, um, and even, I mean, per perhaps one of the biggest was even, so for Nkrumah and Sekou being president of Ghana and Guinea at that time was a means to an end. There was always a desire to move beyond those kinds of colonial nation states. And that is why when Nkrumah was overthrown, Sekou Ture invited him to become co-president of Guinea at the time, right? And so there were, and so for me, a lot of my work is in Latin America, and I'm thinking about some of the parallels that that exists in sort of Latin American iterations of socialism, Pan-Americanism, or Bolivarianism, or however you want to call it, um, because of the ways they're trying to think beyond, um, you know, the ways these sort of these nation states both limit our, our material resources, what we have access to in land, um, and the material reality, right? Like, you know, Guinea, I think, has enough natural water resources to source clean water to all of West Africa, yet because it's a former French colony, is still importing bagged water from France, right? Like it's you know, so they're very sort of material. Y'all see, y'all ain't getting above critique. <laughs> Sorry, but it's not just America. <laughs> so it's interesting to think about um, the that kind of shift if you want, from a sort of idealistic and perhaps even kind of bourgeois notion of pan to one that thinks very really in a real and concrete way about the daily material lives of people on the ground on the continent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and in the formerly, at that time colonized, and formerly colonized world. Boop. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for your questions. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, on the interwebs. <laughs>